an inverter is an electrical circuit that converts direct current into alternative current, like for example, the current from a battery to the main outlet. There are two kinds of inverters, modifying sine wave and pure sine wave inverters. The first one is cheaper, however, it's not suitable for some home appliances like phone chargers or coffee machines. On the other hand, a pure sine wave requires a more sophisticated commutation process. Of course, if you try the experiment shown here, make sure you use all the safety equipment as you can, because the voltage levels used in this circuit may be little, indeed. Since in digital electronics we only can turn on or off a lot, apparently there is no way to put a sine wave in a digital pin. However, by using the PWM aka pulse width modulation, it is possible to regulate the amount of voltage applied to the load. If we compare the sine wave with a sawtooth of higher frequency, we get a PWM signal with two D cycle varies with the sine amplitude. Then, by including a low pass filter, the pulsating signal is smoothed to obtain a well shaped sinusoidal waveform. The idea is to take power from a 12V battery and to step up the voltage until 110 volts at 60 Hz. To do that, I use a 12V transformer in a reversed connection. I mean, the current gets in the lower resistance and the amplified voltage is measured at the higher resistance side. Since the transformer is, in fact, an inductor, I need to include a capacitor at the output to get a low pass filter. Additionally, the system must induce positive and negative voltage to form the sine wave, therefore, we have to use a full H bridge. When the PWM signal is applied to the gates of the transistors Q1 and Q4, current flows from left to right. Similarly, when the PWM is applied to the transistors Q2 and Q3, the current flows in the opposite direction. I use the LMD1800 full edge bridge as a power amplifier, so I need to generate a PWM and direction signals. This power circuit can handle up to 55 volts and 3 amps continuously. I hook up all the edge bridge with the secondary coil of transformer while the primary is connected in parallel with a capacitor and a plug card. Now, it's time for the hardware description. A plot diagram of the pure sign inverter is like this. I use a timer, a generic counter, a sign lookup table, a special purpose counter and a comparator. The timer generates a pulse which increments the counter. This value may be seen as the corresponding angle. The sign run output is the magnitude of the sign, which is compared with the special purpose counter output. The resultant signal is commonly called sinusoidal pulse width modulation or SPWM. I want the sign lookup table to have 128 points. Every point of the sign is an integer value which ranges between 0 and the maximum dot cycle, but at this point immediately rises the following questions. Which is the maximum duty cycle and what's the timer period? To answer those questions, first we have to compute the number of ticks per sign step with the following formula. I divide the master clock frequency by the product of the line frequency per the number of sine steps. The operation results in 13,020, so I need 14 bits to come from 0 until this value. Besides, by using this value as the maximum duty cycle, the PWM frequency would be computed as follows. The PWM frequency equals the master clock frequency over 13,020. This is around 7.68 kHz which is quite low for a coil's commutation. To increase the commutation frequency, I divide 13 and 20 by 4, which results in 3255. With this later value, the commutation frequency is around 30 kHz. I think it's much better. Thus, the timer's period is 13,020. The sign lookup table is 12 bits of width, whose maximum value at 90 degrees is 3,000. The special purpose counter must count up to 3,255 and then return to zero to start over again. First, I describe the counter model 3,255. It has three inputs reset, clock, and increment signal ENC. 
the output is a 12-bit vector which increments its value with every rising edge of the master block. The counter's architecture is behavioral since it compresses two processes, a combinational and a sequential one. But I don't want to bore you with the same script in every video. If you have any doubt, make sure to watch my previous videos. To list the 128 sign points, I prefer to write a program in C to compute the sign, multiply per 3000, convert to binary, and to write such values within an HDL file. It's worth programming time because otherwise, it would be impossible for me to type all those values without making one single mistake. Now, I described the top-level model named Pure Sign Inverter. There is only two inputs, Reset and Clock, and two outputs, PWM and DIR. I followed the Flux diagram previously showed. I include the timer, generic counter, sign lookup table, and the special purpose counter. The comparison is described with a conditional statement. I set the reset signal with a formula which starts in zero, and 10 nanoseconds later it goes high. The clock signal is set to 100 MHz clock input with a high level at the first part of the cycle. It's enough to simulate 20 microseconds to realize that the circuit works as expected. Now, I create a new project in Vivado to implement the circuit designed with a Silence Arctic 7 FPGA, which is included in the DigiLens Spaces 3 board. I include all the VHDL source files and also I download the XDC constraints file. This file is used to define the connections between the top level signals and the FPGA pins. Once the synthesis is finished, I make sure there is no errors and proceed to the implementation and bitstream generation. Finally, I download the bitstream to the FPGA through a USB cable. The system works flawlessly, but the real question here is how efficient this inverter is. In real life, every physical system has losses. In other words, the output power is always less than the input power. I change the battery for my power supply in order to measure easily the input power. For the output side, I connect my oscilloscope to measure the RMS voltage and my clamp current meter. After some calculations, I discover sadly that my inverter has as much 56% of efficiency. That means that, for example, if I use a 100 watt hour battery to power my inverter, I would use effectively 50 watts hour as maximum. Nevertheless, I'm pretty happy with the design. It works as I supposed. But now, I want to test the design with a more powerful system. I get a 12 volt 10 amps transformer, so I need also a more powerful H bridge. I decided to use the VTN 7960 in a full bridge configuration. Since the H bridge model requires two PWM signals, I have to edit the top level code. I change the direction signal for a second PWM. After implementing the design, I test this new hardware setup, but this time, I attach a bigger load. Unfortunately, the shape of the sinusoidal is quite different. I think the shape of the output is due to the frequency of the PWM signals. Once again, I check the VTN7960 datasheet to discover that the maximum supported frequency is 25 kHz. Then, I change the sign lookup table and the special purpose counter in such a way to have a PWM frequency of around 23 kHz, but only to discover that the zero crossing sections of the sine wave are still flatted. Despite my failure, I decided to compute the power efficiency. With the voltage and current reported by the power supply, I get an input power of almost 28 watts, while the output power is around 24 watts. With these values, we can readily compute the efficiency, which is 89% approximately. Great! Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and, of course, learned something useful. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And remember, the engineering is for creating, not to destroy.